Um, my name's Brenda Meller, and I'm here to talk to you today about social media tips and tricks. So without further ado, we're going to jump right in here. And I'm um, kind of going to go through three areas, why, uh, which networks, and how to get started. And then along the way, I will be answering some questions, and I think we're going to have some time at the end for Q&A as well. OK, so um, I want to kind of get started with you know, the why. And there's a lot of reasons why you want to be active on social media. And my guess is many of you are active on at least one, if not two, if not three networks. But there might be a few people in the audience who aren't. So I always like to kind of start with the why. And uh, then I'll be go going through the which, like I mentioned, and then some of the hows, so how to get started and how to actually work those networks to make sure that you're, you're getting your message out there effectively. So before I jump into that, I want to know what, what brought you here, I mean, to this event, or to, is there something specific about this topic, social media, that you're hoping I'll, I will cover off today? Any volunteers? If not, I'll pick on you. Anyone? OK, people in the front are always my easy target. So how about you, sir? But we sat in the front. I know. You sat in the um, front. I'm here just to see uh, um, just to see if there are ways that we can improve our business. OK, ways to improve your business. Nothing specific. OK, good. OK, anything specific regarding social media that you're hoping I'll cover today? Any sites, questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm here to help tell our story, okay. I guess, better. OK. I would love to help use social media. Okay, so how do you use social media to tell your story better? Okay, perfect. And how do you use Twitter? Okay, well, we'll have some time on the back end, and maybe we can cover that off a little bit deeper as well. And why as well on Twitter? Vine. Oh, Vine? Yeah. Okay. I haven't used Vine a whole heck of a lot, but I'm guessing that Rich may have used Vine. I'm calling on you, Rich. So he might be a good expert on that network. And that's a good point. We're, I'm not experts on every network, every place. I kind of pick and choose the ones that work best for me. But there's going to be a lot of networks that are going to be out there that you know, may work better for you. And, and some of mine may, might work well for you as well. And one more. And how do you monetize? How do you know that you're able to monetize? How do you monetize your use of social media as regards to your business? OK, perfect. Well, I kind of want to back into why am I qualified to be here in front of the room. And rather than go through my bio and talk about my history and LinkedIn and et cetera, et cetera, I want to walk you through just a week in review on some of the networks that I've been active on and some of the activities I've been doing on those networks. So starting with, this was actually last weekend, I came to the Walsh College Library because I'm a student and I was doing some study in the library. So I took a picture of my notebook and I posted, used some hashtags on there and put it on Instagram and tweeted and Facebook posts on that. Okay, And then I, I spend probably more time than I like to admit on Facebook. So this is just the other day, an example of a post where I'm not pushing Walsh all the time. I try to put little things out there to get some engagement going, get some conversations going with my friends and family. And this was just, I posted, you are my favorite person of the day. And I got a bunch of people replying back to that saying, hey, I thought I was your favorite person of the day. And oh, glad I'm, I'm glad I'm your favorite person of the day. So that was on Facebook. I do check-ins on Foursquare. I do them not a lot, but I do them occasionally. And usually what I do as a woman, I'm always a little bit concerned about my privacy. So I don't check in when I get to a place, but I usually check in when I leave a place. The only exception to that is when I'm in a big public setting where there's a lot of great people in the room with me, I feel safe environment, then I may do a check in at the, at the location itself. But you can see I hold, uh, I'm not sure how many mayorships, but I've got like 41 badges and a bunch of activity out there in Foursquare. My husband and I used to compete to be the, the mayor of Walgreens, so I don't know if that's something you all do, but <laughs> it's a big deal when you get the mayorship. I don't know. So then Pinterest is something, and I, and I kind of started dabbling in Pinterest to figure out, is this something I could even use for Walsh? And by creating my own boards and using it for myself, I kind of figured out how I could use it best for my business. But this is a board that I've created, and I, I kind of create my boards based on you know, fun descriptions because I want people to see them and follow them and, and like the things that go under that category. So I was looking for food ideas for my toddler. My little girl Charlotte's two, and she's getting very, very, very picky about things. And I call this one, I've resorted to tricks to get my kids to eat healthy. So that's kind of a fun Pinterest board. Um, YouTube, this is something that uh, my blender broke about, I don't know, a week and a half, two weeks ago, the little spindle thing in there. As it turns out, if you put like frozen bananas that are whole in your blender, your blender will break, just so you all know. And the little spindle thing that turns your blender, all the things will kind of shred off the top and then your blender won't work anymore. And I really didn't want to go out and buy a $200, $300 blender and I love my KitchenAid blender. So I bought a new part off of Amazon and I got the part in the mail and of course it has the instructions on how to put this part in and pop it off and they don't work. So what do you do? You go on YouTube. And you type in how to replace a coupler on your KitchenAid blender. And I watched a video about how to do that. And you can see that video gets like 77,000 views. 
This was uh, actually Monday of this week. I was getting ready for work, and I had, you know, got my work attire. I'm getting ready to go out the door, and I just realized my daughter had, like, the same kind of clothes. She had, like, a teal-colored shirt and a black jacket over top of it. So I had to take a picture, and I used uh, an app called Aviary, which is related to Instagram, and then posted that. And you could put a little... Uh, uh, text at the top, I said my mini-me. So I posted that through Instagram on my Facebook and kind of showed that up. Aviary, A-V-I-A-R-Y, I believe. Aviary, like a bird aviary. I don't know why they call it aviary, but that's the name of the app. And I restarted my words with friends. I'm actually um, going against Jan. This is a, a game I have against my friend Connie and I've restarted that. So this is kind of the virtual Scrabble if you haven't played it yet. It's a lot of fun. Um, playing against Jan and playing against the president of Walsh and some of my friends and family too. So it's kind of a fun thing just for relationship building, downtime, stimulate your mind a little bit. And then uh, I do several social media sessions through Walsh. I actually gave a session earlier this week on LinkedIn for business professionals and this is just one of the slides that I had presented during that session. And this was kind of interesting. I'm not sure for those of you who are active on LinkedIn if you've noticed it or not, but originally LinkedIn would give you percentage points and they would say, your profile is 50% complete or 75% complete or 90% complete. Well, they changed that probably about, I don't know, six months to a year ago, and now they give you rankings into categories, starting with beginner, then intermediate, then expert and all-star. And if you're interested in becoming an all-star on LinkedIn, these are the things that you need to do on your profile. So I kind of learned that and was presenting that as a topic. And um, you know, a while back I was saying, gosh, you know, I love Facebook and I love Twitter, but wouldn't it be great if there was a network where nobody complained, where you just talked about the happy things in life? <laughs> And I posted that on Facebook, and I think it was Charlie Wolberg who replied back and said, there's an app that's called Happier. You should check it out. Mm -hmm. So I checked out this app called Happier, and you can post. It reminds you. It sends you notifications. Or, you know, post three happy things. The more happy things you focus on, the happier things you'll bring to your life. So I will go out there periodically and post on Happier, and I did this one saying, working on a social media presentation, and I wanted to share it with you guys. So it's kind of a neat, neat um, positive network. And then, you all know what this is? Anyone know what this is? Candy Crush? <laughs> I vowed I would not go on Candy Crush. I was doing so good. And then my son one day, we were playing on his iPad. He's got iPads through his school now. He's in, in third grade. And he's like, let's try Candy Crush. I'm like, all right, I guess my better judgment. So now I'm on level 37. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, avoid it if you can, but you know, I buckled in. It is a good, I mean, Jan and I were talking actually before the session. It's a good brain break. And it kind of reminds me of Tetris, where you're moving blocks around and things like that. And one day I had to go out on Facebook sheepishly and say, gosh, I'm, I'm stuck at this level and I really need to get onto the next level. And nobody, Jan was so kind to give me a, a unlock code and I had to get two more. And I kept subtly, because I didn't want to be one of those people that were like pushing, pushing, I need help on Candy Crush, and I had to. And then the other picture, I just have to throw in the third one there, when you're locked out of Candy Crush, there's a little crying heart. So you know you're playing Candy Crush too much when your daughter knows the crying heart. Like she's mimicking the crying heart in that picture. <laughs> So a little embarrassing there. And on my way in today, I took a picture of the marketing uh, messaging media poster that was at the bottom of the stairs, took a picture of it, Instagram, hashtagged it, posted on Twitter and Facebook. And then I saw Jan in the hallway and we were talking about an upcoming event for Walsh, so I took a picture of that. And there's actually, it's a soup to nuts, how to get your business growing. We're offering a special discount for everyone from this event. You can attend as a Walsh partner for only $45. If you'd like more information, see Jan. But we were talking about that. So I said, well, that's a good way to promote my business. I'm going to take a picture of that, tweet it, hashtag post it, put it out on, on Facebook as well. And then I was getting ready to come up, and my husband, he's taking my kids to a Halloween party today. So Joshua, who you can't even see, God bless him, he's in this ghoul costume with these red light-up eyes. And Charlotte, you know, she's a, a little uh, strawberry. So I picked her up some Christmas uh, pajamas with the, the polka dots on it. So he just posted a picture a little while ago, and that's something you know, I liked it on Facebook. So that's kind of in a week, and it's only Sunday at 1246, so I imagine I'll be even more active. But as you can tell, I mean, the purpose of this exercise was just to demonstrate that social media is kind of integrated with what I do, both personally and professionally. It's not something I tap into as I need it for my business. It's something I'm on all the time, both because I enjoy it, but because it is something that I see a lot of benefits to my business.
So why use social media to tell their story? And I think there's a lot of reasons why people are so active on social media and why business owners and entrepreneurs and small businesses are using social media. And I categorize those into a few of these areas. It's opt-in, meaning we all want the information. So we go onto Facebook, we set up an account, we like pages, we follow companies on, on LinkedIn, or we follow individuals on Twitter. We are seeking their information. I mean, gosh, think about how much money we spent on advertising, marketing, even public relations, trying to get the word out there for people to notice us. And these are people who sit, who've raised their hand and say, yes, I want information about you. Gosh, how powerful is that? And it's, it's in both people stumbling across you, but also you can find people and encourage them to like you, tweet you, follow you, uh, join your group on, on LinkedIn as well. Mass appeal, I mean, that's where people are nowadays. They are hanging out virtually on Facebook, like it or not. They are tweeting each other. The celebrities understand the mass appeal that they can get with all of their, their fans out on, on Twitter as well. Options, I mean, there's so many different ways and so many different networks and so many different, you know, whether it's videos or pictures or just text messages, taking pictures of flyers and posting them out like it, I did this morning. A lot of options. And then fun. I mean, it's not just your, you're not just watching TV and trying to DVR through the commercials, which we all do, but we're participating in social media. We're active out on social media. So I think it's a great for that reason. So I just want to show you a couple of quick examples when I talk about the opt-in and the mass appeal. And these are a couple of examples of the Walsh sites. This is our Twitter page, and this was as of last night. We had 2,400 followers on the Walsh Twitter page. So gosh, how much would I pay for those people? I, you know, I don't know. But that's a, that's a nice following to have. This is out on our LinkedIn, and this is actually our company page on LinkedIn, and we've got about 1,400 followers. Now, LinkedIn recently introduced a university page as well, so that's another outlet that I'll be using for the college. But this is just a way people are actually following updates on my LinkedIn page for Walsh College, just like they, they follow me as a LinkedIn user as well. And then this is for uh, Facebook, and I, I was trying to go back, because from the beginning of time, when I first joined Walsh College back in um, 2008, December of 2008, going on five years now, there was not a Facebook present at all for the college. So I was trying to go back and see historically, you know, how do we, how do we get to the three, what is it, 3,478 likes on the Walsh Facebook page. And they only actually will go back, I think, 90 or so days. So I went back for a little bit of history on there. But just the fact that there's a lot of analytic data that you can get on your Facebook page as the company page administrator. And I strongly encourage you, even if you're a small business owner, get a Facebook page. It's free to do so. Once you get to, I think, 25 people liking your page, then you can give it your own personalized page address name. And you can do that through friends and family. Just tell them, like my page, and start to build up your following. And then you get some insights. You know, are they male or female? What are their age group? Where are they coming from? I mean, these are all customer insights that you could really use to help market your business. And then finally, YouTube, I just went in there, and I was, gosh, really shocked at this. I mean, Walsh College, we've got like 2,300 uh, views of our videos. And we do everything from student and faculty testimonials. I know we've had Denise do a video testimonial from us, to our, our commercials, and people watch these commercials, and commencement student speakers, people will watch these time and time again. I even do a series with, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Walsh College Yellow Suits. They're kind of our ambassadors for the college, like our mascots of sorts. And anytime we take them out to an event, we're at a parade or some other place and we're kind of standing around, I'll have them sing a happy birthday song and I'll give them a list of 10 first names. So happy birthday to Denise, happy birthday to Lynn, happy birthday to Jan. And then I post each of those videos separately on YouTube. And guess what? When people are searching YouTube for happy birthday Lynn, they're going to come across a video. And they're going to watch it and they're going to play it and they're going to look how cute this is and look how cool. So just thinking about you know how to use things a little bit differently, bringing people into my page and then in the description, and I may link back to the Walsh College website or some other page as well. So, um, and the, uh, fun, I mean, there's a lot of fun that you can have in both, you know, singing the happy birthday songs, and y'all remember the big Harlem Shake movement, which was back in, I think, February of this year. And we are a professional business college, but we have fun here. And I wanted to show you a quick clip of this Harlem Shake video that we put together. <laughs> So I want to move
move on to the next category, which is, okay, I, maybe I've convinced you you want to be active on social media or even more active on social media, so now which networks? Where do you spend the, your time on there? And really what you need to do is be on every single network that's on this page, okay? So can you guys all do that? Be on every network? Yeah, does that sound good? Okay. I don't even know what some of these icons are, so you do not need to be on every network. Um, really what I would think of in terms of considerations is a few different categories. One is where, where do you want to spend your time? You might be the kind of person who says, I do not want to be on Facebook. I think it's worthless, I think it's social, it's I'm a married person or I'm a different type of person, I don't want to be on that network. That's okay, you don't have to be on Facebook, but your company has to be on Facebook. Sorry to say that, but your company has to be on Facebook. So think about who within your organization, you know, are there employees, are there customers, are there other people who are active on those networks that might be looking for you on Facebook or that can help you out with your Facebook efforts. Because like it or not, people are on Facebook and you're missing out on an opportunity if you're not on there. Bare minimum, you could set up a page on Facebook and do nothing else with it. You can let your customers and fans post and like and comment if you'd like, but I think bare minimum you should at least try to get that company page set up. And again, it's free to do so. Everything I'm talking about today is free. I'm not talking about any of the paid networks or anything that you're, you're paying for. How much time do you have? You know, I don't have time to do this every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I have maybe 15 minutes a day I can spend on this, to devote to any, any of these networks. So, what I would suggest is pick and choose a few networks that you really want to get active on and, and learn more about and figure out if they're going to work for you and your business and commit to one for a week and spend 15 minutes on that network every day, Monday through Friday, until you get the hand, hang of it, until you understand the etiquette, until you understand how to use it, how others are using it, how you may be able to use it a little bit more effectively. You might go, you know what, this isn't going to work for me. Okay, scrap that network, try another one. And do that same thing, 15 minutes a day, every day, until you get into that habit. Over time, you're going to find that you don't need to be on it 15 minutes every day. You might be able to be on it 15 minutes a week. Or you might find that there's automated tools, things like Hootsuite or Twitter alerts or Google alerts, things that you can sign up for that can help to feed that information to you. And then you can simply respond back when people are commenting on your tweets or watching your videos or posting things for, uh, on your company page on Facebook. But at least figure out you know, from there how much time do you have and really Carve out some time because if it's important, you will find the time to do so. The next, where is your audience? You may say, you know, my audience, Brenda, is not on Facebook, so I don't need to spend any time on Facebook. And I would say, okay, but where is your audience? Are they on LinkedIn? Are they on Twitter? Are they on YouTube? What other networks do you think you can find them on? And you definitely want to make sure that you have a presence on a couple of those sites. And then, you know, the last is, are you even interested in social media? And you might fall in that category of like, no, I'm not interested in social media, but, you know, I can't leave the room right now because this is a, a session, and there's sessions afterwards, and I, I really want to talk to the media people. And that's okay. But what I would say to you there are figure out the people that are in your organization. I'm actually going to go back to that in a second. In the organization that you might be able to identify as ambassadors and can help you out with those efforts. And I'll show you an example of that in just a second. First, I want to go through just a couple of the networks. And these are the ones I would say bare minimum. These are the ones that I'm active in. As I mentioned, Earlier. I'm not active on Vine. There's a couple other networks that I'm not super active on. Google Plus is something where I've signed up. I understand I have to play in their sandbox. I understand I have to have a presence because by having a Google Plus profile, I go to the top of the Google listings. But outside of that, I don't see a lot of value in it for me personally at this time. Now, my digital marketing firm is telling me you really need to be more active in Google Plus. So I'm going to start getting more active probably from the college purposes in that site. But I want to start with LinkedIn, and I think LinkedIn is the must-have. That's the number one network. If you don't want to be on any other network, bare minimum, you have to be on LinkedIn. It's different because it's a purely professional networking site. It's not social. So keep in mind, when you're setting up your LinkedIn profile, when they ask you for your birthday and your marital status and things that are not professional related, you do not need to put those, and I would actually recommend not putting those on your LinkedIn pro profile. It is um, the equivalent of a professional networking uh, website. It is not a social website. So anything social, kind of kick that to the curb. Um, think of it as almost a virtual website, a little bit of a resume with some bells and whistles, but think of it more as a virtual Rolodex, if you will. It's a way that you can connect with people and stay connected to them over time. So think about this. How many times we change jobs in a lifetime? I don't even know what that stat is nowadays. Is it eight? Is it eight times? I remember my college, I think it was one of my college professors said that you're going to have three jobs. You're going to have the first job to get out of college is to get a job. Your second job is going to be to get out of that job, and the third job is going to be the job that you love. And I'm on, I think, five or six right now. So think about how many times we change jobs over a lifetime. Every time you're at a networking event and you get those business cards, you know, look at the business cards and see, do they have their LinkedIn address on there? If so, say I'm going to send you an invitation to connect on LinkedIn. If not, ask the question, are you on LinkedIn? Invite them to connect with you. That way you don't need to worry about these little business cards, and as they move over time, you'll still be able to stay in contact with them. 
How long have I worked? I'm sorry, who are the I questions? How long have I worked here? I've worked at Walsh College for five years now. Yeah. A little story behind LinkedIn, I actually got my job at Walsh College through LinkedIn, and that's why I'm such a big advocate of the network. Um, I Back in 2008, I came to the point in my career where I realized at the company I was at, I wasn't going to go any further and I was ready to make a change, which if you recall 2008, that was probably the worst time to come to that conclusion because of everything going on in the economy. I knew my competition was working full time at their job search because they weren't working and I was working full time with a family and didn't have time to a job search. So I decided to devote my efforts to a non-traditional search. I didn't use Monster, I didn't use Hot Jobs. I only used a LinkedIn and a couple other aggregate services. One day there was a posting for marketing manager at Walsh College from the hiring manager. I made a direct connection to him, sent him my resume, and I think out of the 300 to 400 resumes he received before closing, and he says mine was the first resume he received, he emailed me back, we had a little bit of conversation back and forth, and I guess the rest is history. So it didn't get me the job, but it definitely got me to where I am today. And since then I would say I'm probably more active in LinkedIn than I ever was at a job seeker because of the professional networking aspects of it. If you connect with me on LinkedIn, and I strongly encourage you to do so, you'll find that I'm going to be one of those people that is top of mind for you because I post status updates frequently. I try to help my network. I share jobs forward. I try to make connections. I'll make introductions. So please use me. That's what I'm here for. And I have a powerful network. I think I have one of the most powerful networks because of all the great people that I connect to. So please let me know if I can help you in that regard. One tip I'd like to give you as a takeaway on LinkedIn is personalize your invitations. So you know the standard text that you send out invitations, I'd like to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn. Never, ever, ever use that ever again. And if you say, well, Brenda, I can't because my smartphone won't allow me to, well, I would say put down your smartphone, go to a PC, and personalize your invitation. And the reason you want to do so is because I think that that invitation text is almost the equivalent of professional spam. You really want to take the time to let the person know who you are, why you wish to connect with them, and ask for that invitation to connect with them. So a bare minimum might be, hi, Denise, it's Brenda. We saw each other at the conference this morning. Let's connect on LinkedIn. Let me know if there's anything that you need. Give them a frame of, of context, rather, how you, how you know them and why you wish to know them. So that would be something, if you walk away with nothing else from today, you remember that, that invitation to connect. Next, Facebook. As I mentioned, you know, this is where people are right now. I mean, they've, uh, uh, they've had the Facebook equivalent of, I'm not sure, it's like the largest country in the world now. Or every, every day it's like it's bigger than this and it's bigger than that and it's bigger than the next big thing. So this is where people are right now. I don't want to go too much into here, but one tip I would have for you if you are on Facebook, both on your personal profile as well as on your company page, think about when it's socially acceptable or professionally acceptable to be on Facebook early in the morning, at the lunch hour, and after work. So if you're posting in the middle of the day or in the middle of the afternoon, by the time those folks are getting online back on Facebook again or can admit to be back on Facebook again and can like a post because it's okay to do so, your post may be so far down in the stream that it's kind of lost. So if you think about posting early in the morning, you know, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, around that noon hour, and then 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night, that's when people are going to read your posts. Um, so that's something you can actually go into your analytics and look up a little bit more too on days of the week when people are actually looking at your posts. But I think that was a really good learning for us at Walsh. When we started scheduling our posts at that time of day, we started getting more engagement in our posts. So YouTube, um, you know, great video network. I know Rich talked about this, uh, was it yesterday in your presentation about video? So I'm not going to go into too much depth here. but. Keep in mind, as a page administrator on YouTube, that you have access to insights, and there's really great insights on here. I thought it was really fascinating. You can actually go in, and you can watch a video, and you can see of all the people who watch the video when they drop off. So that might tell you. You might say, well, my ideal video length is five to seven minutes. Uh-uh. You might realize that people are only watching it for the first 30 seconds, and then they're dropping off. So either they're not getting engaging enough content up to that point, or it just really is too long in their attention span. Uh, needs to be, your videos need to be shorter. So the tip here is look at those video insights and, and you can really determine for yourself how long people are watching your videos. That was something that was kind of a neat learning for me. Twitter, um, we're going to cover this off a little bit later. Maybe I'll pull up the site and we'll do some demonstration of, of what Twitter's all about. But if you're on Twitter already, or if you're a beginner on Twitter, you really want to make sure that every tweet that you post, every update, everything that you send out, every message is clickable. So either you have an at with a person's name where it's clickable back to their name, or a hashtag where it's clickable to a thread of activity, or there's a website, or there's a picture. There's something that's clickable and there's actionable within that tweet. So keep that in mind. Instagram, um, this is something I've been using for probably, I don't know, about six months or so, not too long. It's one of my newer networks, but um, I found that some people are now kind of abandoning Facebook because there's just too much stuff going on in there and they're using 
Instagram, which is like photo sharing, and now you have the ability to post videos as well on Instagram. And the big tip here is just not, not don't just post the pictures in the video, post it with a hashtag, make it clickable. So especially if it's relevant to your business, or even if it's relevant on a personal level, you know, post something with pie, and then everybody who likes pie is gonna start looking at you, maybe they follow your other Instagram posts on there as well. So think about that. All right, Foursquare, if you're using Foursquare, this is a location-based social network, so when you go to a location, You'll see sometimes in the store windows, it'll say find us on Foursquare and people will be pulling out their phones and checking into Foursquare. And as I mentioned earlier, you can compete for mayorships for a location. And what a mayorship is, is you're the person who's visited that location the most often and you're not an employee of that location. I figured that out because I tried to become mayor of Walsh and I couldn't. And I kept posting and posting and posting and posting. And then I looked in the rules and it said, if you're the, the employee of the location, you can't become mayor if you have a similar email address. So um, something to keep in mind here, if you are in retail or a service-based industry where people are coming to your business frequently, dry cleaners, restaurants, those types of organizations, if you post a special for your mayors, people will start to share that along. So it's a way to, for, for you to virally get your message out there about your business. I've seen restaurants do this where if it says on your third check-in, you get a free appetizer, show the, your phone to your waiter. I've seen it where on, on bars and restaurants on Friday night, whoever's the mayor that night, that particular night, gets a free drink or something like that. And then Google Alerts, if you have not Googled yourself, please Google yourself, go home and Google yourself. You wanna go into Google, type in your name. Put your name in with uh, quotation marks around it. Put your name plus Brenda, plus Meller. Google your company name as well. And if you are not already using the Google Alert system, sign yourself up for Google Alerts. It's so easy to do, it's free. I set up Google Alerts for myself, the president of Walsh, Walsh College name. There's a couple other keywords, live, breathe, business, a few other taglines that we use here at the college that I will post as a Google Alert. And once a day, Google will send me a message saying, here's the thing we picked up in the media. And sometimes it's uh, news items, sometimes it's just kind of other things that are found on the web. And it's not completely comprehensive, it's not gonna find everything that's out there everywhere, but it's at least giving me something where I don't have to look every day. It's sending me a, a, an alert where I don't have to Google myself every day. Yes, a question? So this occurred to me as I got married in June, so mm -hmm. my last name changed. So does that mean if somebody Googles Kathy Skubik instead of Kathy Gothier, they're not gonna find me? Um, you know, it depends on how your profiles are listed out there. The question was when she got married, is her maiden name, should people be looking, should you be looking at both of them or should they be looking at both of them? And it depends on how you're listed out there. For me, I have myself on LinkedIn as Brenda Zawacki Meller, so that people who don't know that I got married, don't know my new last name, can search for me that way. So if you were to search for me on Google and Brenda Zawacki, my LinkedIn profile would pop up and it would say Brenda Zawacki Meller. And then you'd see a lot of other things for Brenda Meller on there, so they'd be able to make that connection. But if you were in the newspaper, with your maiden name three years ago, mm -hmm. it's not going to come up, right? Well, in Google Alerts is for news items as they're arising. So the question was, if there was a news item three years ago, would it still come up? Unless somebody is reposting it, it's not going to come up in the Google Alerts. But I would say if, if you're concerned that there may still be items coming up with your maiden name, I would set up a Google Alert for your maiden name and a Google Alert for your married name. There's no cost to do so, you know, if there's no information that comes up in that alert, then there's no loss of information, you know, you're not missing out on any opportunities. Good question. Okay, so um, and the next kind of area I want to cover off is how. So we talked about, you know, why, we talked about which networks to focus on, and then how to get started is the, the final area, and then we're going to go into some, some Q&A here. So um, getting started, I mean, the big thing is like, gosh, it's overwhelming, Brenda, there's a million networks, where do I start? Well, just start somewhere. I don't care where you start. Talk to your neighbor and say, where are you active on? And join that network and start getting active on that network. Um, ask others what works. You know, maybe there are people who are in a similar industry as you. Ask them where are they hanging out and what networks are they participating in. Maybe you don't want to ask that of your competitors, but maybe ask that of a marketing person. Maybe ask that of somebody like Lynn who works in PR. What networks do you think I should be active on? Just start somewhere. Don't be so frozen by the fear of not being active or of sharing your information on the internet that you don't do something. Just start somewhere. Um, and then what I always recommend is use each site first on a personal level before starting to use it professionally, meaning for your profession or for your business. Try to figure out how it works. What are the etiquette? How are people using it effectively? And how are people using it that's maybe not so effective? You, you may notice that some people that are using Facebook for business purposes, they're just selling all the time in their status updates. And they're the kind of person over time you're just going to, you're just going to like hide them because you don't want to see them all the time. So think about that. You know, and how could you use it differently and how could that be a helpful tip for you as you're getting started on those networks? And I already showed you this one, so I'm gonna skip through that one. And know your limits. This is another picture of my little darling daughter, Charlotte. 
There's a guy out there, it's the funniest blog, it's called Reasons My Toddler is Crying or something along that lines. And I, I was inspired by him to create my own series of Charlotte when she's having these terrible two outbursts. I don't even know, she was in a car seat, who can tell why she was having her outburst? I think she didn't want the buckle on, she wanted a piece of candy, who knows? It was just these, you know, the, the world is ending outbursts that she has and, and I'm having a meltdown. And you might feel at times like, I am having a meltdown on social media, I just don't have time for this, I'm not interested in it. It's just not something I wanna be spending my time and effort on. Well then think about, I'm going back to the people in your organization that could be ambassadors for you, that can help you out. Maybe there are people who are your employees. Maybe you can hire an intern who's very passionate about your industry, your product, needs to get experience in that to find their first next job. And guess what? These kids nowadays, they grow up with social media. My two-year-old, if I can unlock my phone, she can open up an app and play a game without me even telling her. She's two. I can't even imagine when she's 20 what she's going to be like. My son, when I first brought my iPhone home, I looked at this and I said, I don't know how to make a phone call. There's buttons on here. I cannot figure out how to get into the place to make a phone call. He was, I think, seven at the time, and he's like, oh, mama, you just hit there, and then you go here. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So think about the younger generation. They love social media. Find somebody who can maybe help you out with that. I'm not a big advocate of free interns. I, I believe that you should at least pay the minimum wage to help you out. But think about the folks that are out there to help you. And if you're interested in internships, we also do postings here through Walsh College. I interview regularly for a marketing and PR intern. Anybody who's a Walsh student or alumni can apply for that position. Everybody who applies gets an interview from, from me because I'm a believer in giving people experience. And we usually only pick one a year, so I have two or three that I can usually refer out if you're looking for someone to help you. Was there a hand, did I see? Yeah. Yes. When you're talking to interns, I'm just starting something out with the DECA at the high school. Oh, great. So okay. find out who your business teacher is at your local high school. They are, they are looking to partner up, and Oakland County Schools has got a whole project and an advisory great. board just for that purpose. Great, so DECA is a great organization she mentioned if you're looking for folks to help you out. That's a market, I actually competed in DECA when I was in high school too, so it's a great, great marketing organization. Who knew I'd be working in marketing someday, thanks to DECA. But great organization. So I just want to show you, this is the Walsh Facebook um, fan page. This is our admins, and there's actually more under here. So it's not just me. I, I will frequently have the president of the college coming up to me going, gosh, Brenda, you're doing a great job on Facebook. Well, guess what? It's not me. It's everybody else who's behind the this, this site. And, and these are all people who are active on social media, who are passionate about Facebook, who are spending time on there every day. So guess what? I don't have to worry if somebody posts a complaint on Facebook on, on the Walsh page because I've got 12 pairs of eyes that are behind me helping me out with that. And we don't let the fear of what if people say something bad about our college, our business, um, stop us from being active. We want to act, uh, actually take a part in maintaining um, the status updates that we have on there, managing postings, responding back to postings. If people are complaining or if they have a concern, we want to address it. We don't want to hide it and delete those comments out. We want to be genuine people out there. So onto that, you know, going onto the same topic of keeping it real. You don't want to be overly salesy all the time, as I mentioned earlier. Be a real person, really. Be a real person. You know, who are you in your personal life? Bring that into your social media. If you are friends with me on Facebook, and I have to say that I will not accept friend requests from everyone that I know, there are certain people that I will accept on Facebook that I don't know that well, and I'll put them right away into an acquaintance list, meaning you don't see pictures of my kids. So I have some limits for myself. But if you are in my circle of friends on Facebook, you will know that I love coffee, you will know that I love pie, you will know that I love my kids, you will know that my little daughter drives me crazy, but I love her to death anyways. And I'm a real person, and I will do a blend of personal and professional. Now, on LinkedIn, I don't just promote Walsh all the time. I will promote my friends. I will congratulate you when you get a new job. If there's postings on news items that you have, I will like, I will comment on them. If you're looking for an employee, I will help. I will pay it forward, share that forward to someone else. If you ask me to help you connect to someone, I will help you connect. I'm a real person. I want to help you because you, in turn, will help me. Okay? So just keep that in mind. You can't make it all about your business all the time. Um, social media karma. I'm, I'm a big proponent of you want to pay it forward before you ask for something in exchange. So the more that you put out there to the universe, to the universe, here, let me help you, the universe is going to help you in exchange. Um, and then be professionally social. Um, you know, there's not too many people I'm seeing in the room that would have a concern, but it's usually the younger generation that thinks, well, I can kind of be Facebook Brenda over here, and I can be LinkedIn Brenda over here, and I don't have to worry because there's a bubble here and there's a bubble here, and I can kind of separate the two networks, and you don't need to worry about people interacting. Well, guess what? That's not the way the world operates. And anything you post, as we know, on the internet can stay on the internet. And even if you use, I think the new thing is Snapchat. Have you guys heard about this? 
where you can send a picture or a video, and as soon as the person reads it, it's deleted. Well, guess what? You can take a screen capture of that and tweet it, and then you're out on Twitter, and you're in front of the whole world to see. So for me, I always keep in mind um, professionally social on Facebook, professionally social on Twitter. I'm never going to kind of cross the line and go into posting things that um, I wouldn't want others to see. And this is just uh, uh, my, another one of my Pinterest boards. As I mentioned, I love pie. I don't even know what it is. Every, every once in a while I think about, you know, maybe I don't really love pie all that much. Maybe it's just people think I love pie. But then I start thinking about it. I'm like, no, the crust is really good. Then you've got the, the pumpkin, and there's the apples, and you got like Grand Traverse and Ackett's. And yeah, I love pie. I really do love pie. So I created a board, and it's, uh, I, I've kind of owned the pie. Like there's people out there that own cupcakes, and, and bacon is like a big thing. I'm like one of very few that owns pie. So, you know, come join my pie loving obsession. Follow my Pinterest board there. All right, so I think that's kind of it for my overview of the networks. And we've got about 15 minutes, so I want to take some time for Q&A. And if we want to spend a little bit of time on Twitter, I can give you guys a quick demo of that. But maybe let's start with Q&A first, if that's OK. My question is about LinkedIn. You have your personal LinkedIn page. So at, for your business, you should have a LinkedIn for your business as well. A LinkedIn company page, and that's where you would put your business logo and that. But on your personal page, would you, with your personal picture, would you put your current logo for your company underneath? I wouldn't. I wouldn't use it for your picture avatar picture. Okay. You might want to use. I've seen some people use a, a logo as bottom of their picture, but keep in mind your LinkedIn profile picture is like this big, so you really only have room for a head and shoulder shot. And that's something to keep in mind, too. Don't do a full body shot. Don't do a picture of a group of people. Just head and shoulder, very professional, pleasant, pleasant smiling, no sunglasses. But I, you know, what I do, if you look on my LinkedIn and, and do connect with me if you're not already on LinkedIn, you'll see that in my job description uh, for Assistant Vice President of Marketing at Walsh College, I have the Walsh College logo in there. I have a description of the Walsh College degree programs. And even in my professional summary statement about myself, I describe who I am professionally, but I also describe some of the offerings of the college. So I kind of blend both, both those into my okay. personal profile. And then will that click through from your personal page to your business page? Um, the logo, I don't believe it will. But the name, the click through back Yes, to yes, back to the business, yeah. And in order, uh, speaking of company page, in order to set up a company page on LinkedIn, there's a couple things they have as kind of qualifiers. I think you have, have to have at least 50 connections, so they're trying to make sure you're a real person who's active on LinkedIn. You have to have an email address that matches the company webpage. So my email is bmeller at walshcollege.edu, and our company webpage is www.walshcollege.edu. So if I was using a Gmail and trying to set it up for Walsh College, it wouldn't let me do so. But outside of that, it's free to set up a company page. You can add your logo. You can add videos. You can add representatives who may be salespeople for your business, and they can connect with them directly. You can even ask for recommendations from customers who've purchased your products and put a product posting on your LinkedIn company page. That's something that I do for Walsh. I'll put the MBA program, and then I'll share that with students and alumni of that program and say, recommend this on LinkedIn. Jump into Twitter if that still sounds OK with you guys. We'll spend a little bit of time on that. I'm going to pull it up on screen here. So how many people in the room are on Twitter? Just curious. OK, look around the room. Keep your hands up. Look around the room. You're, are you tweeting right now? Live, live tweeting is encouraged, too. Here I am. So here. So when I, yeah, so when I click on this at connect, I can see anybody who has mentioned me in a post. OK? Yep, so this makes it uh, trackable back to me. And, and if I had my phone open, which I don't right now because I'm presenting, I'd have, if I had my notifications set up, I'd get a, a notification saying, someone just mentioned you in a tweet. Yeah. And then it'd pull me out to the web there. Yeah. Oh, and then you tweeted it. <laughs> and then I want to just show you real quick, too. This is my Twitter you know, feed. So these are all the things that I've posted. And you can see that you know, this one I did kind of a retweet. I commented something back to Duke. This was actually one that I retweeted, so it's actually posting it as his as his tweet on Twitter. Um, anytime I post something or retweet it, it's going to appear in my homepage feed here. Okay. Yes. Question. Not really a question. Just I thought of maybe kind of a better way to explain it um, sure. with hashtags and um, also tagging people. I guess. Um, I use it like I'm just going to say something about what I'm doing or um, what you want someone to know. So for ex example, like right now, I'm at Walsh College um, at a social media conference and Brenda Miller is doing a wonderful job speaking. And you would just turn whatever word, I'm at a social media is your main word, and just put a tag before that. And so it's just a normal sentence. A normal sentence, you turn whatever you're, you know what I'm saying, yes. into it. Yeah. Okay. Between the two of you, we finally cleared that up. I've yeah. got a question. How do you use it? You know, I almost think about um, hashtags sometimes as air quotes. 
You know, people are like, I'm going to Walsh College, and we'll be talking about social media, and we'll be talking about LinkedIn. So think about, it's a category, a word, a phrase. You know, if you want to group yourself together with other people who are talking about the same thing, the hashtags are a really effective way. And I think the hashtags started on Twitter. I could be mistaken. But now they're on LinkedIn. They're on Facebook. They're on Instagram. I mean, just about every network is kind of picked up on, on hashtags. I don't know if they're on Google+, Plus because like I mentioned earlier, I admitted that I'm not active on Google+. They are, they are. They are on Google+. Plus. See? That was Can I ask good. you for some clarification? Sure. Um, so the hashtags, if you click on it and you go to it, like you put MMM up there. Right. And there's nothing about this conference when you go to that. You would right. have to do at your people, which is our, right. you know, our yeah. hashtag. But if you go to that, you get everybody who said, mmm, like, you know, donuts. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. That's what you get there. So the yeah. question is, to click on it, yeah. it takes you to wherever there's this thread of conversation. Correct. Um, outside of clicking on it, mm -hmm. can you explain how it benefits a business to hashtag, you know, how is that going to give them exposure sure. or build yeah. awareness for them in some That's way? That's a great question. So if I were using that hashtag, you know, I will do this. At, I, I, instead of taking notes at a conference, I will tweet now. Because if I take notes, I'm going to have to remember where those notes are and then I have to do something with them and I may be using those to tweet with later. So what I do is if there are key takeaways I have from a conference, I'm going to tweet those. So I might, I might say I attended the marketing mess messaging conference today and learned about Twitter and I put a hashtag about Twitter on there. And then I also learned that you should use social media for your business and I put that social media. And I also learned that as a marketer I should be active on Facebook and I use the hashtag for Facebook. Well, all of these tweets that are coming up, people are going to now start to understand that I have an interest in and some experience and expertise in social media. So if I start using words that are words that I want to be known for, that I want to be associated with, people are going to start to associate me with those words. Is there something else you wanted to add on to that, Lynn? The other thing I just want to thank you for answering that. I appreciate it. Because um, it's important for people to understand we do it at this end, where does it take us? You know, what's the exposure? Um, if you don't mind my throwing this in there, my experience has been that Twitter for businesses is perfect for establishing yourself as a thought leader or an expert because journalists now are getting their ideas and their contacts and their sources from Twitter even before email. So even media people that I know really well, and I'll email them and I'll call them and I have their cell phone number, but when I give them a direct message on Twitter, I hear back instantaneously. So Twitter now is a great forum for um, being known and being recognized by journalists. So. You know, just as, to add on to that point as well, if you are trying to make a direct connection with somebody in media, I mean, gosh, social media, and you now can tweet directly to them. And just like I do, I will go through periodically and look and see who's tweeting about Walsh or about me. I may not respond to every per single person, but I do read them. And I would bet that that media person is reading those as well. And they're going to notice if you're retweeting them. And they're going to notice if you're following them. So that's something if you're starting to build a relationship, it's not just about you, you, you. But if you want to make it about them and how you can help them, retweeting them, quoting them, even following their interests and starting to learn, well, this person really has an active interest in the Troy area or in the Ann Arbor area or in retail or in automotive. You can kind of see that from some of their tweets and messages. So you think about how, can you, how you can use it to understand others as well as how others are using it to understand you a little bit better. Good point. Yes. So is it safe to say if you have an 18-year-old sophomore in college that you can no longer find anywhere on Twitter that they've done some magic sort of blocking thing? Like, I can't even find her. And she just responds, well, Mom, I need to have one segment of social media that you can't see me on. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll Google her. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm pretty sure she's she's smarter than that, but <laughs> like Lynn knows. Yeah. I can find her on Facebook, but she's just like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tweets, right? Exactly. Facebook is the agreement. Like we have to have. And if she doesn't call home, I just threaten to post on her Facebook wall, and then she calls is me right away. Right. Well, you know, I mean, you can't, you can't, I mean, even your employees, your siblings, your kids, you can't control what people post on Twitter and on social media. But I think the key thing to keep in mind for you there is just to remind her, that's fine if you don't want me seeing it, but just remember anything you put on the internet stays on the internet. And if you don't feel comfortable having it on the side of a billboard on 696 or wherever, use your description here, it really shouldn't go out there, even the Snapchats and things like that. And, and I feel like kids just feel like they're, you know, they're, nobody can harm them and the information they put out there is, is in a bubble and, you know, Pop. <laughs> I have a question. 
I know a lot more people than I have following me, and I want to know how to build the following, and, and even on Facebook. And I tried to use their um, constant contact import, okay. and it never works because I'm still at, on Facebook, you know, but both. I want You're to trying know. to get people to like you on Facebook and follow you on Twitter. Right. Is that right? Okay, so what are you doing to engage with them? Are you liking them and following them? Do you know what their interests are in their businesses? Are you kind of doing Well, I'm starting now more on, t on Twitter to get more involved. So then I notice all of a sudden people are liking me for sure. But my Facebook is interesting because I only have 1,500 people and I'm much more out there. And uh, I tried to do the constant contact import of all my 4,000 email addresses. You want addresses. to be careful about that though because that might come off as a little bit spammy. You know, like you're asking them to friend you. And some people like me, I don't accept friend requests unless I know you very well. And if, even if, you know, you get into a category of acquaintance, I kind of put you in this little holding cell before I accept the friend request on Facebook. No, so, it's liking my business. They're my business. business. They're, they're my, the okay. contacts are my business. Oh, your contacts are. And, and some people may, I'm not sure what your business is. Is it yoga? Is that right? Some people may not want others to know that they're active in yoga. Or they may not want to share their personal interests. So by liking your page, they may not... Well, the interesting thing is that. nothing changed in the yeah. numbers. I don't yeah. think that thing is working. You could ask the question, too. What I would do is ask your network. Say, I can be found on Twitter, Facebook, and here. You know, which networks are you active in, and what information would be helpful to you on these networks? Make it about okay. them a little bit. And then how do you build the Twitter? Just by liking other people's yeah. things? I mean, stuff? you know, in the beginning, there was a lot of, like, auto-follow tools that were out there where you could... Um, Auto follow someone based on keywords, and it and it really helped to increase the number of followers that you you were follow or people that you were following because of that. So, for example, for me, anytime somebody mentions Walsh College, I will automatically follow them. So, for you, you might want us to do an auto follow based on somebody mentioning the, the keyword yoga or health or those sort of things, and that might be a way. But you know, you're going to get people who don't have a strong level of engagement with you, other than the fact that they've it said the word yoga, and they might see, oh, this person started following me, so they may do an auto follow automatically or in exchange for that. Yeah, I mean, the big thing I think is you want to have engagement. It's not, for me at least, I found it's not a numbers game. It's not getting to 2,000, 5,000, 15,000. It's more about what content am I giving them that's valuable to them and how am I engaging them within the conversation. I'm not just blasting information out. But, you know, for me, one technique we'll use here at Walsh is we use people like Denise in videos. And then we say, hey, Denise, here's a video that we created. Feel free to share this on your social networks. And then I'm using her as an ambassador to get the word out there, too. And you're putting so maybe her there's at in her, her name or whatever? Yeah, I mean, if she's on Twitter, I would use the ad. If she's only on Facebook, I might post it on her Facebook page or her company page. So maybe ask your customers, can I feature you as a customer of the week on my Facebook page? And by doing so, they're going to share that, and then their friends and family are going to go, oh, look, this is so-and-so. John's on the page, and I want to like it because he's a celebrity this week. Yeah, you know? OK. All right, I think we're just about out of time. Um, so thank you very much. I hope this was great for you guys. On the tips and trips handout sheet, I have my contact information. I prefer to connect on LinkedIn. And um, look forward to receiving those invitations. Make sure you personalize them, OK? Thanks, guys.